Welcome, Chelsea Rise to the People of Color Living with Diabetes Virtual Summit. I am so excited to have you here with us this evening. Go ahead and introduce yourself to our viewers and tell them a little bit about yourself. Yes, my name is Chelsea Rice. I'm uh, uh, originally from uh, the state of Georgia, a um, little town called Tacoa, Georgia, then Athens, Georgia, then lived in Atlanta for like over 30 years. I'm living in Pensacola now. Um, so it's, this is where I get lost because I was like, I was like, what would anybody want to know? And it's like, I was like, ah, nobody wants to know about that. But so, yeah, so I'm um, um, living in Pensacola now. I've been here like a little over a year. Uh, I'm still getting used to it because, you know, you're living in the ATL for like 30 years. It's kind of a you know, culture shock. Um, been diabetic for a little over 30 years now. Uh, mm -hmm. I was diagnosed back in late 80s, maybe 88, 89. Um, so, you know, I, I guess you could consider that the dark ages almost. I mean, uh, we weren't sharpening needles to take insulin and stuff, but, you know, it was, it was the, the dark ages compared to where we are now. No CGMs, no... Um, uh, there were pumps, but there were, you know, you'd have a really hard time getting approved for a pump back then. Um, wow. And so, yeah, so it was basically a learning experience. We didn't, there was no, you know, online community because there was no online. Um, so it was, um, I, I kind of like the fact that I came through that period because now I'm actually, you know, noticing the, the things that are opening up and things that are available um, to us now. And then, how we can better manage our diabetes um, and have a faster access and an easier access to support. So that's always been, uh, been something I really appreciated, the fact that I've been doing this so long. Wow, thank you for that response. Um, I'm gonna pause really quickly. One thing that I'm um, talking about that. So you explained a lot of changes there as it relates to let's say managing diabetes back in the day and managing diabetes nowadays, would you say, of course, I, I, I'm sure you would say people are better off, right? But with all the technology and everything that people have at their disposal these days, would you actually say that you can identify any cons to how diabetes is managed versus how it was managed back in the day? Um, it's hard to find any cons because like I said, what, what, would, what I dealt with back then is um, a lot of isolation because mm. uh, I was diagnosed when I was 25 and so um, when that happened you know the doctor would suggest you go to a support group or something like that and of course back then it wasn't online it was like you know face to face uh, at some little uh, room at the doctor's office or whatever or the library um, and more often than not I was the youngest person there mm. and there was like in the 60s and um, you know, seeking some support, and so that kind of stuff is um, it kind of um, makes you not want to be bothered with it, yeah. you know, because you can't relate to anything. And it was that's when you know I started noticing that I was getting what I didn't know was diabetes burnout. Mm. You know, I just I didn't where well, I've been in this by myself. I didn't know anybody who was diabetic. I didn't know have any friends that were diabetic that I could talk to about about it you know and so it was just it just became something that um i had to grow into because like i said i was isolated in a sense wow and that's something that we've been hearing i'm sorry yeah. um that's something that we i've been hearing time and time again i know the viewers that have um seen other videos in the summit have been hearing that from so many of the other speakers saying that they were isolated or they felt like they were the only ones let me ask you this chelsea when you were going to those support groups did you see anyone that look like you no no and, and at the time and it's you know when you say that um you know i never really thought about it but at the time i was living in athens georgia now, athens georgia obviously is a college town and at that time the majority of the african americans that you saw in athens were mostly was townspeople i mean there was a fairly decent population of black kids you know at the university but in the city, um, these were, I mean, 
when I say a college town, if it wasn't for the college, the town wouldn't be much of anything. Mm -hmm. So there were a lot of um, African Americans living there, uh, close to the poverty level. Um, there were no, there were very few black people that you saw affluent, unless mm -hmm. they were happened to be a doctor or a lawyer, something of that nature. That you didn't really see a great deal of um, black business owners. If they were, they were smaller businesses. You know, it, nothing that you would say find in a, a Houston or Dallas or, or in Atlanta. Um, and so, you know, now that I'm thinking about it, it makes me wonder if there were actually, you know, any black people that were taking advantage of the, the fact that they um, wouldn't have any type of support or any type of uh, groups that they could go to speak to someone about or if, or if they're even taking that time to have a one-on-one -on -one with their doctor. Right. You know, is that's hard to do today to have a one-on-one -on -one with them to, to actually get a doctor long to sit down long enough to have a conversation with them. Back then, it was a lot easier, but you know, you have to really kind of um, make the doctor aware that you have some issues that you want to talk about. True, true. And that's that's where we tend to. I think between you and I, we can actually think of family members that were pretty closed off to opening up about the things that were bothering them. Mm -hmm. um, you got an ailment that you don't talk about it, that um, I have a family member that has cancer but won't really talk about it and don't really, when they're in pain and not really you know, let anybody know they're in pain, that type mm -hmm. of stuff. And the, obviously a lot of that is ingrained in us as a people uh, because that's the way we were made to be. Yeah. You know, and so that burden gets passed down generation to generation. And a lot of it has to do with the region. Because you see a lot of it in the South. A lot. Um, mm -hmm. And when it comes to, say, uh, education levels, things of that nature, that's going to separate um, you know, how people you know, better take care of themselves or be more educated about their health. So. Yeah, I, I didn't see a lot of people of color that were taking advantage of, of opportunities About services. to like, learn more. Yeah. yeah, and the reason that I, I asked you that is because, you know, you said you went and, and you were the youngest, and so you really couldn't relate to anything that they were talking about. And it makes me wonder if there had been someone of color there, even if they were older, would that have given you more of a reason to, to continue, you know, attending the support groups and now, I do believe that we as a people, we, we need community, right? We weren't designed to do life alone, but we also feel more comfortable around people that look like us and can and, and identify with us. Um, one of the things that you said that made a lot of sense talking about some of the struggles, and, and I think it's not just in Black culture, I think it's actually in a lot of communities of culture, how we kind of harbor things and don't talk about it and we're uh, you know, kind of it's in us to be really stoic about our feelings, emotions, and all of that. That's why for me, it's so important as a nurse to represent those individuals that look like me. It's because I know that we do that. So I'm going to spend my time exploring a little bit more, pulling that information out, spending those extra few minutes getting that information out of my clients, because I know that we have a tendency to do that. So one of the things I wanted to, oh, go ahead. Did you want to make a comment about that? I agree because that um, it takes a level of patience mm -hmm. to really kind of um, reach people. I mean, and you see that in a lot of things. It doesn't necessarily have to be uh, health care. It's just when it comes to, to voting, mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to uh, financial education, uh, personal finance you know, things of that nature. So you see that a lot. People don't want to talk about it. They just get through it in a mm -hmm. sense. Keep and your head down and get through it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Exactly. So it's um, it's hard to say it sometimes, but it's just it's in, it's in us. Right. It's kind of hard to shake because I'm guilty of it as, as well. You know, even in, in other things in my life that I'm, I'm guilty of. Wow. I'm glad you said that I, in one talk with um, Benicia Malone, when we talk about exercise, the new drug, um, I actually mentioned how, you know, we have healthcare disparities and we can't put it all on the, you know, healthcare providers. Some of it is our behaviors as a people. 
um, and as a community that we have to be a little bit more forthcoming, a little bit proactive with our health behaviors as well. Uh, and it's not just one side, it is so many different layers and so many different factors that go into it. Yep, exactly. It, um, sometimes it is gonna have to take a push mm -hmm. um, to get us to, to get past that. You know, it's, um, we can't get into that thing well, they won't let me and I, I can't do this because they, yeah. Well, there's a great deal of truth in that, but you can't let that prevent you from pushing forward. And you know? Especially and, when it comes to your health. Oh yeah. And that's one of the things that I've kind of like uh, had that kind of battle with uh, mentally is I don't want to come off like a, like some pull yourself up by your bootstraps kind of rhetoric but I don't want to be so passive mm -hmm. where I continue to blame a situation or, or, or something that's happened to me or, or my, based it on my, my upbringing, things of that nature. A lot mm -hmm. of it is going to, that I'm trying to be middle of the road here and get to say, you know, I know I got a problem, but I know I got to do something about it. Mm, I like that. That type of thing. I and, like that. And it, that's the thing that I try to, I get frustrated with a lot of time with people that I meet, you know, in various situations, like I, my job, um, I work in a, for a financial institution and it burns me up sometimes when I talk to us, watching us do these things that are detrimental to us financially. You know, you can't just sit there and put in five applications for the same loan. Mm. Or, Expecting it, playing it like it's a you know, slot machine or something. It doesn't work that way. Oh, Chelsea, you stepping on toes. Well, I mean, it is what it is. I mean, that, that's the thing. Is like, I mean, I understand that you know that that information was kept from us. Yes. You know, when we talk about um, black wealth, basically understanding the difference between wealth and being rich, you know, being poor and being broke, mm. that type of thing, and when you it just it just it gets to me sometimes when it's like i need y'all to understand something the only way we're gonna get out of this is if we do something about it because yes they are happy to keep us where we are wow because now you said a word there you said a word and that's you know we talked about that a little bit before the segment started that's the ultimate reason why the summit the people of color living with diabetes summit um, was created is it's because it's taking the solution into our own hands and trying to bring something to the people that's actually going to help the people. And, uh, and like you said, something that's kind of for us, by us, for us, um, for lack of a better term. Right. And we're going to get, we're going to get pointed at, fingers going to start pointing at us because, oh, they just, they just want to be separatists. They just don't, they don't want to get along with us. They just want to, just want to be, so it was like, well, we've been waiting for you to acknowledge us. I didn't say let us in. Right. We know the door is unlocked. Right. But it doesn't make any sense that a condition like diabetes that affects us more than it does white people, mm. like you can't speak to us sometimes. About it. Right, you right. You don't need to, you know, brush us off and pick us up and carry us and rock us in your bosom. But it doesn't make sense when you have a condition like that that's, that's more prominent in people of color, mm -hmm. and then you just don't do anything to even to even represent them. Mm -hmm. You know, to do justice. Yeah, go off all day as far as like you know, organizations like the JDRF. I'm so you know bent out of shape with them. It's like every time I turn around, it was like somebody talking about a gala, a mm -hmm. ball, these tuxedos and 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 ball gowns and all this kind of foolishness. It's like, what is it exactly is that doing for these folks that are struggling to pay for their insulin? Mm -hmm. What exactly is that doing? I mean, I know you feel good about yourself because you got up, you know, got off work and got your clean dress and got your tux all pressed and all this kind of stuff. And you go out and throw a little money around, then take some mm -hmm. pictures and post them on Instagram and Facebook looking all this, that, and the other. But what does that actually do? Do you know? 
where that money even goes or how much of it goes to um, a particular fund right. um, for some type of financial assistance. All good points, all good points that you, yeah. that you made. Yeah. That's what I'm saying because they're they they're complacent with us being that way. Because mm -hmm. let me work. let me explore that a little bit. Go into that further. They're complacent with us being what way? By us not making any noise. Ah, yes. By us not calling it out. By us accepting it. Right. Because you know what comes when you when you when you acknowledge somebody that's making noise, you're gonna have to deal with them. Mm. Okay, and that's wow. that's just the real, you know. Anytime you start acknowledging folks that you know are marginalized, then you're gonna have to. It's like, oh God, here we go. Now I got to deal. It's like you know when you start, you you pick up your phone and you see a caller ID to somebody that you know that you don't want to talk to. Yeah. And what do you do? You're just like, oh, here they come again. Now if I answer it, now I got to deal with. It. Mm. So I'm not saying they're. <clears throat> they're being so dismissive and just ignoring us, but there is a level of complacency that obviously is just too obvious. Mm -hmm. It's way too obvious that, that they're complacent about what they're doing. And so is that our fault? Have we caused that as Black people? And right now I'm gathering you're specifically talking about Black people, right? right. Have we caused that to a certain degree, in your opinion? I don't think we've caused it. I think um, we haven't taken advantage mm -hmm. of the fact that we have more power than we know. And mm -hmm. we've been hearing this on so many things, whether it be in the vote, uh, as far as our money, yeah. we got more power than we know, but we've been playing for the opie doke telling us that we don't have that power. Wow. You know, you, because that, that's been the whole process. If you demean a person and make them feel like they're not worth anything, they ain't no threat anymore. Mm. Wow! They'll sit up there and they'll they'll hide on their own. You don't have to scare them anymore. Oof! Now that was a word. Know, that, that's just, and I'm just, you know, that's that to me. I mean, it sounds kind of, you know, mean, and, but you know, it's just that to me is just the way it's always been. It's like that to me. That's the process. Right. You beat a person down to the point. I mean, it's like that old um, that old fable of a man who chained an elephant to a stake, it was a big, strong stake uh, with a chain on his, on his leg. So the elephant would walk away until he couldn't pull that, that stake out of the ground because they had to get that heavy chain on his, on his mm -hmm. leg. But then the guy goes back and changes that chain to a piece of twine. But he's conditioned to that chain. Yes, and he tries to walk away and he feels that resistance. Speaking wow. of, he can't pull that, break that, thread. This is the same thing. Wow. You know, this is the same thing. You teach somebody that they're not worthy, that they that they can't do, what are they going to They're going to start to believe it after a while. Mm -hmm. Then after that, you don't have to do anything. Wow. You know? I hope the viewers are listening. We got to get them to break this twine. <laughs> I mean, that is, that is a nugget there. And here, and here I thought we were going to have jokes and comedy. And you are just flat foot telling us the truth. And I agree with you. I really do. I think that a lot of what you say is true. And that's why we are having these conversations so that we can get people to thinking and looking at things differently so that they can be more proactive um, in their health seeking behaviors. I want to transition from that. It's heavy uh, and, and we need to have heavy conversations, but I want to move forward and talk about um, you, you're called the type one comedian. And I want to know, did you start doing comedy before you had diabetes? Was it after your diagnosis? And do you do that? How do you use your comedy to get your message across um, as it relates to diabetes? I didn't start doing comedy um, before I was diagnosed. I didn't start doing comedy until I was like, I think I was like 35. And oh. I was just on a whim. I just figured like take a comedy class. And then you know, um, it just turned into something that I got pretty good at. And so I just kind of followed it from there. And then um, what had happened was I would, how I transitioned using comedy in the, the diabetes advocacy is <clears throat> I used to do these shows for these guys who ran um, a little show up at a bar and they found a way to make some side money by um, hiring the show out 
for different uh, organizations to have fundraisers. Mm. And so they would have um, some, um, or even uh, a dog shelter or something. You know, they want to raise some money, so they'll hire us to perform and, you know, charge covers and at the door and then, you know, to collect the money and have, you know, a good um, uh, donation, you know, pile. So, so, and I started thinking like, well, I could do this with diabetes. Mm. And that's when I started reaching out to um, the ADA and the JDRF in Atlanta um, to kind of get some support because I wanted to have like someone there at the show with some you know, documentations with, with uh, resources mm. and that they could give out to people to make, to educate them about diabetes. <clears throat> so that's where it all kind of started. Now it's, and you know, going forward the more I did it, eventually I got a job at a comedy club in Atlanta. I was like the sound guy. <clears throat> and um, one comedian, uh, Robert Schimmel, uh, he used to be on Def Jam back in the day, white guy, but he was, you know, crazy funny. He was, um, he, um, he came and performed one weekend and I got to, since I was running sound, I was also like his kind of driver. I'd take him back to his hotel after the show and stuff. And so we got to spend some time together and talking and he had uh, been living with uh, cancer. He had, um, I forgot what he'd had. It wasn't, um, I forgot what it's called, a kind of a blood cancer that he had. And um, he talked about his cancer in his act. Mm. He would go, he'd basically do his, you know, his regular act, and then he'd start, towards the end of his set, he would start talking about his treatments and when he'd go to chemo and all this kind of stuff. It's, it's, it's really funny stories that he would tell about when he was in, in chemo and going to chemotherapy and stuff like that. And he and I got to talking, and I was like, you know, I was telling him that I, was, I wanted to talk more about my diabetes in my act. And he, he basically told me, well, that's, you, you need to do that. Mm. There's, no, there's no question that you need to do that because you never know who you're going to reach. Yeah. And I learned that um, more than a few times after I do some jokes in my show, in my, in my sets and stuff. There would be people to come up to me after the show. One lady, I remember she came up to me. I thought she was going to shake my hand, but she pulled her pump out and showed mm. it to me. And I was like, oh, wow, well, cool. And we just, you know, compared pumps. And she told me that she really appreciated what I did because she doesn't, she's never really talked about her diabetes mm -hmm. in an open form. And so I guess when she's around her friends or whatever, she doesn't really talk about her diabetes. And to me, that's, that's something you got to do. Mm -hmm. If you're diabetic, especially if you're around your family and friends, you need to talk about it. People need to know uh, what you have and what they may be able to do if you need help or something. So mm -hmm. in that respect, Absolutely. we need to talk about it. But there's been so much stigma about diabetes that, you know, these, all the other jokes that people make about diabetes, about being overweight or lazy and mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. These are the, that's the stigma that's been created and that's how people don't take the disease seriously. Mm -hmm. And it gets kicked to the side and not nobody gives it a lot of great deal of attention and don't understand the dangers in it. I, I don't know whether it's so much that people don't necessarily die of diabetes, they die of diabetic complications where that mm -hmm. just kind of skews the whole thing and people don't really see diabetes as a threat. But they got to understand that it was diabetes that made that possible for that. Right. Correct. So, so when it comes to like jokes about diabetes, I don't joke about, uh, you know, the, the typical things that people always talk about, uh, make jokes about the amputations. Uh, mm -hmm. Anthony Anderson made a, made a joke about it on Blackish uh, several seasons ago. Um, and you'll see all kind of other, you know, silly references to, like I said, the amputations and uh, being overweight and all that kind of stuff. So I don't talk about I don't joke about stuff like that because how how could I make jokes about amputation and then all of a sudden there's somebody in the audience right that has had amputation I don't have that right that's not my that's not my story mm. now I've lost vision in my right eye I can talk about that all day because that's mine mm. I can talk about you know what how I feel about it what what it was like to go to the eye doctor and deal with all those you know silly things that I had to deal with because mm -hmm. that's mine. So I basically talk about my diabetes and my experiences. Okay. And try and find the funny in it because a bunch of, if you don't know, there's some absurdities you're going to have to deal with when you, when you deal with diabetes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's 
trying to get medications or just trying to live your life around other people that don't have it, trying to explain to them, you know, what you're dealing with. Mm-hmm. So, um, and that's been something that I've, I've always done. I've always had that knack for like finding the absurdity. Um, In certain search situations. Yeah. And because I grew up on 70s television watching all these, you know, golden age you know, comedy. I remember watching, you know, Samson and Son and the Chico and the Man. <laughs> Black Carters, all that stuff. That was that was like uh, because like I grew up in a small town, so was, TV was it. Mm-hmm. On last key kids, you know, my parents worked, and so we came on, you know. They, and for the viewers that don't know what a latchkey kid is, those are kids that come home and open the door for themselves while their parents are still away at work or doing whatever they're doing. If I forgot the key. I knew how to climb the ladder and climb it through the bathroom window. Uh-huh. <laughs> we did it all, you know. So, wow. Yeah, I mean that's and that's where I kind of got a lot of my twisted sense of humor is just watching all these different comedians uh, as a kid. And um, but for me, uh, the comedy is like a like a weapon because it gives me the power wow. over the diabetes. And I still get you know depressed about it because it's, it, depression kind of comes, you know, it's like a, a optional accessory mm. and i mean you'd be you'd be a, a brick or a piece of stone you know to not get uh depressed about it um because it's depressing to deal with you know prices and medications and the price of going to the doctor or all these things and so you just, that's something that i learned to accept mm-hmm. that it's not just me i mean i'm just reacting to my condition, and I have every right to feel that way. That's right. You know, I have every right to feel, you know, upset about the fact that I lost vision in my eye because that's my eye. Mm-hmm. So it sounds like the comedy is also, to some degree, therapeutic for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because it helps me get a lot of stuff that I'm feeling out. Yeah, it's an outlet. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, it's, a, it's definitely an outlet because that's not a lot of stuff you want to have sitting on you. Mm-hmm. Uh, every day at some point you know whether it's just, just posting something funny on Instagram or whatever or just doing something on stage get that out some mm-hmm. way to find, some way or another I would only encourage anybody to you know, get into comedy if it's not their thing but find some way to get that out mm-hmm. um, because you can't dwell on that all the time that's a good word of advice and plus the stress is going to you know exacerbate your diabetes mm-hmm. you know very true. So would you say that the comedy is what led you to then diabetes advocacy? And then is that how you also got into the online diabetes community space? I'd like for you to talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Um, as far as the diabetes online community, that kind of came out of nowhere. Uh, well, what had happened was I don't remember there being a lot of um, diabetes advocates on MySpace back in the day. Then Facebook kind of took off and then I got on there and I started just bopping around looking for other people with diabetes and discovered that there was a, a community. Wow. As a matter of fact, and then eventually I found out there was various communities, you know, uh, just tons of different communities, people all um, working towards um, helping people live better lives uh, with diabetes. And I got inspired to do it, um, but the, my thing was, was like, well, I'm just a comedian. I don't know anything about. I'm not. I'm not a physician. I'm not a healthcare professional. But you know, mm-hmm. I can make some jokes. That's kind of if anybody's liking that type of thing. So, and that's what I did. I just kind of used what I had. I like and, that. Um, and and I still kind of you know question myself and second guess myself when I try to. Uh, get involved in things because it's like, is anybody going to take me seriously because I'm just a comedian? I don't really, you know, I still struggle with carb counting you know, mm-hmm. to this day. Um, so I, you get these, I think when you strike out to be an advocate, you you deal with days when you feel like a fraud. And um, that's just realistic because you're putting yourself out there. And yeah looking at you and somebody and, and believe it or not somebody's out there depending on you mm-hmm. you know um 
because I, I get through that. I go do I go through it all the time because I ask myself, am I actually doing anything? And I watch you know other advocates do these you know phenomenal things either online or in the community. And I figure like, well, I'm just punching a clock nine to five, and all I do is you know post stuff online. But when you talk to other advocates and they tend and you find out that people are actually paying attention to what mm-hmm. you're doing. Yeah. It's kind of, you know, it, it takes the, the weight off. It's like, oh, I yeah. guess I am Because I think you're probably like most people, you're your hardest critic, right? And so for me, oh, yeah. and what you described was kind of like a little bit of imposter syndrome. You know, I get that. Most most Black people I know that, um, most people I know get that. You know, I'm not going to put a color on it. Um, but I also, one thing I've learned in the last couple of years, and I say this all the time, is keep your eyes on your own paper. You know, um, keep your eyes on your own paper. Nobody can do you but you. And the world needs exactly what you have to offer, whether that's putting funny, you know, tweets on Twitter or, you know, co-hosting a, a, a diabetes virtual summit. You know, nobody can do what you can do. And so we have to learn to give ourselves grace and not be perfect. And I, I believe as long as you're positive and you have the best of intentions, then that really can go far. People will realize um, that you you have really good intentions toward helping others. So what are, what is your advice for getting involved with diabetes communities? I think it's imperative for people of color to get involved because what we've seen, um, we've seen the ripples of the death of George Floyd Mm-hmm. seeing the ripples of that affect people of color in a lot of different areas. And when I say areas, I don't mean like actual locations. In no. Place. I mean just in communities or just in groups or just in I mean, we've seen it affect um, the gay community. We've seen mm-hmm. it affect uh, the disabled community. This, this, all these different people are starting to speak out now because you know we've seen what happened and everybody's had enough mm-hmm. it just we, we're asking ourselves when is this going to stop and my theory is uh, the only fear that i have is are we gonna is this going to become uh, one of those things that was hot for a minute and then next thing because you because you saw it mm-hmm. playing his day on facebook and you know instagram right after the protests kind of died down. Now everybody's worried about Will and Jada. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, and that was one of the things that I posted is like, oh, really? This, this Now we're going to go, now it's all about Will and Jada? How is this? The entanglement. <laughs> yeah, because last I checked, neither one of them had much to say. Right. You know, and, and that's the thing about, especially with diabetes, is like, why are we worrying about all this other mess when these people that you're getting all worried about was Will and Jada or Nicki Minaj, all, all these different pop artists and actors and stuff, when they ain't talking about us. So tell me about this organization that you're involved with called Type One Communities of Color. Um, um, exactly what is the organization about? What are your initiatives? And how can our viewers get involved with the organization? It's kind of, a, I guess you could say it's a, an offshoot of Type One, a T1 International. Okay. Um, and they have been at the forefront of the of the hashtag that you may have seen on insulin for all because mm-hmm. they're like uh, insulin for all di- um, division pretty much all over the country there's florida georgia all just about i think there are a few states that they don't have any uh, um fractions in and so they've been on the forefront of uh, bringing awareness to the the um the plight of people having to ration their insulin. Mm, their insulin. They basically have to weigh, do I eat or do I you know, afford my insulin? Mm. You know, uh, several people have died because of rationing their insulin. Um, people are using the Walmart insulin. And I've, I'm, I've done that myself because I've been out of work and had to just you know, spend 25 bucks on something try and get me through I know that and that's and that's one of the reasons that I was kind of drawn to it when they offered me that um that uh, position because I want to get more people of color 
involved in this. Mm-hmm. It's not so much where I just want to reach them. I want to get them involved. I want to get them mobile and just get a, start a movement. Mm-hmm. Um, because we've been talking about this for so long, about trying for these different orgs and other companies to bring us to the table or invite us to the table. Now it's like, <clears throat> and like you said before, you know, I, we just got to build our own table. Yeah. You know, we've gotten to the point now where they don't, if they don't have a chair for us, we bring a chair. But you know what? Mm-hmm. This is this is my thought process, and, and and I know some people may disagree with it, and some people may think that we're being separatist and all this kind of stuff. But you know what? It is what it is. We got to start making our own. Mm. Uh, because this has been us for a long time. As long as we've existed in this country, we've had to create our own. Mm-hmm. And we've been accused of being separatists, that we don't want to this, that, and the other, and yeah, whatever. If that's what you're throwing to think, fine by you. But you know, I want to add a comment there because you said it earlier and I forgot to, to say it. I had an interview with Kylene Redman and she said something that resonated so strongly with me. And she said, we've never been not having open arms to anybody when, when we talk about black and brown people. And she said, even if this is a people of color living with diabetes summit, we, w- w- we've never excluded anybody. So we can call it people of color and still have representation from every minority group, every group, period. And I thought, well, you know what? That's so true. Like, we've always accepted people with open arms regardless. So I don't think we'll have that problem. You know, they can call us separatists. And I've tried to make it very clear in advertising this event. This is not just for people of color, but it's focused and targeted toward people of color because we're the ones that have the least access to resources in healthcare. And I, and I said the exact same thing when I was, uh, there was a there's a podcast that I want to put together. And someone asked me, was this, is this for people of color or is it for well, white people, you know, get involved too? And it's like, I'm not locking anybody out. Truth of the matter is the white people that want to listen to the podcast, they might learn something. That's mm-hmm. what I'm trying. Mm-hmm. You know, you're in, nobody's trying to, and that has been something that has just cracked me up every um, for the longest that every time we try to do something, someone thinks that we're trying to, you know, Mm-hmm. Oh, that way, y'all just being racist. You, know, you don't want to be like, what? No one said you could, couldn't join us. Right. I mean, and why do I have to rip out the parchment and send you an a invitation? Mm-hmm. See, this is the thing about us. We know what it's like to be marginalized and be ignored and being downtrodden. Yes. Then exactly in our nature, to treat somebody like we've been treated. Yes. Get well that, said. Okay. That's what that's what we've been talking about. We've been talking about that for, for decades. We've been we're usually the anybody marginalized people are the last people in the world to marginalize anybody else. Absolutely, absolutely. So, yeah, nobody's preventing you or locking you out. I mean, but then again, I'm not gonna sit there and pat you on the head and hold your hand either. Mm-hmm. You know, you do what I did. Show up. Wow. That's what I did. I, I took my black self into every situation I can bring myself to be in and whoever's uncomfortable is just going to have to go get some water because I'm here I've got because I got work to do you know that's <laughs> it's like somebody told me if you don't want your toes stepped on you better wear steel toe boots or you better move your feet out the way well, go find your ottoman and put your feet up because <laughs> go put your feet up <laughs> here I come wow I like that show up and I think that's you know going back to getting involved people of color getting involved and diabetes communities, specifically, I think online is easier, but you also talked about just trying to get them involved, like with the type one insulin for all movement and advocacy in general has been tougher, I think, for people of color, specifically um, African Americans or Black Americans, whatever that they refer to be called, than I think other communities of color. Why do you think that is? And why do you think now is the better time, the best time than ever to go ahead and get involved in that advocacy? Well, the reason I think it is, I mean, I could come up with a lot of different ideas as to why um, 
so difficult to get it. It is involved in movements in general um, because some of it is just hard headed. You know, it's just, it, I mean, and like I said, I'm just, it is what it is. Some of it is just hard headed. And, but, and then there are others who just don't know. Mm. And need to be shown that is not exactly what they thought. It's not as hopeless as you thought it would be. You know, um, we thought a black man, they would never get elected president. True. You know, you think about all the folks that came up through the civil rights movement and saw that happen. Imagine how they felt. Mm, very true. Every day they turn around, somebody looked like they had been murdered. And then all of a sudden, this country shows up and lives up to its credo. Mm -hmm. Imagine how that felt. And it's the same thing. You know, we have to, it's up to us, those of us who are out here already, to try and bring folks in and let them know it ain't exactly what they told you. Mm, I like that. It ain't exactly what you think. And you have more power than you think. And truth be told, you have a responsibility mm -hmm. to get in here and change this because you're making a way for somebody else. Mm -hmm. That's the whole reason I got in this because I know what it's like to deal with that self-doubt, to deal with that fear, to deal with the anger, to deal with the depression. And if anything that I can do to prevent someone from going through that or at least let them know that I know how it feels. Mm -hmm. I have a responsibility to do that because here's my thing. If I don't do that, if I don't show somebody that in spite of this condition, that they can go on and do something, whether it be great or small, then all of this is in vain. Mm -hmm. I lost this for nothing. So I got to take this and turn it into something else. Prove mm -hmm. that, I, that, it, that this is not going to define me. That this is not the end of me. Now, tomorrow I might get depressed and start thinking that, you know, but that's just the reality. That's that's because I'm human. Right. But Let's I have down. to remember this conversation and what I just said. Mm -hmm. So... I like that, that you say it's a responsibility. And I think that for many people, I know we've, I've had conversations with colleagues about this, um, particularly we were talking about things that occurred after the death of George Floyd. And we were talking about um, how allies or people that are not of color, um, they don't feel like they should be the voice, you know? They don't feel like they know someone should be speaking out, but they don't really feel like the responsibility should be on them. And uh, I remember saying something very serious, like if you're the person that sees the problem and you know that it's, you know, there's an issue, it's, a res it's your responsibility to speak out against it. And so I kind of, um, I, I, I'm comparing that to what you're saying to the viewers now, um, especially in communities of color, if you see it happening, especially if, you know, you have the diagnosis yourself, it's your responsibility to be involved and to advocate on your behalf and on the behalf of others. Right. Because once you understand the reality of um, what's going on with us right now, the way we're being kind of just looked over, mm -hmm. once you understand how serious that is, once you understand how something like redlining prevented that information from coming into that community, mm -hmm. how they prevented fresh markets from being built and served in your community, thus mm -hmm. giving you no way to, to find fresh fruits and vegetables and good and decent, healthy options to eat other than some bodega or some side store mm -hmm. or some some store run by somebody who is just as marginalized as you are, but now they want to sit up there and, and turn their nose up at you and treat you like. And overcharge you by two and three times. Going, going to, 
the Publix or Kroger buying their milk, then sticking their price tag on it, mm -hmm. overcharging you for bread and, and milk because you got no other, you no other choice. You don't have mm -hmm. a way of driving across town to get to a good grocery store. That's see, that's that's taking advantage of you. Mm -hmm. You got to understand that. But your power is you don't have to fall for it. That's right. If you come together as a community and start creating a, a shuttle to take people to that fresh market mm. periodically, they lose their power. Mm. They lose their customers, they lose their money, and, they, and what happens to them is what they deserve. Wow. So, and this is where you take your power back. And this is what we're doing with this, with um, trying to get, you know, more people of color involved in advocacy because we've been marginalized enough so the orgs and other different, you know, programs don't take us seriously. Even though they know the numbers, they know how it affects us, but still you don't want to get out in the street mm -hmm. and try and educate those that don't know. And then when we hit you up about it, we were like, well, I didn't, well, I didn't. We weren't trying to, you know, we understand that, but then again, you weren't trying to make it right either. Right. So it's on us. It doesn't, it, and I don't, and like I said, I wouldn't pressure anybody into getting into any type of advocacy. I wouldn't do that to anybody. Yeah. Because um, I, I think your heart has to be in it, right? I think yeah, it's, yeah. You have to feel compelled. That's why I say about a lot of the work that I do is even when I don't necessarily want to do it, I feel compelled to do it. And so what about those people that are watching that really do feel compelled or called or, you know, it's, it's been on their minds and on their hearts to get involved. How can they get involved with your organization? Um, you can basically look for T1 International. Um, just basically Google communities of color, T1 International communities of color. And it'll take you to a page um, that you'll see a ton of African American and people of color with diabetes, uh, a bunch of basically just soldiers. I mean, these people are just awesome. Uh, what they do, many of them, they may not be um, big names or uh, making magazine covers or anything of that mm -hmm. nature, but they're out there making noise. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing, and I've, and I've discovered so many people other people of color that have diabetes that I never knew were out there. Go on Instagram and put in a hashtag diabetes, put in a hashtag uh, type one diabetes or type mm -hmm. two diabetes and see what pops up. Mm -hmm. Connect with these people. Send them a message like, hey, I dig what you're doing. You know, uh, let me know if there's anything I can do. They'll hit you back because they need your support. Mm -hmm. So if you have it in your heart to want to do something in the diabetes community, or if you want to do it in the cancer community, or uh, MS, or whatever, what may, it may be on your heart. Social media is like the easiest way to do it. To do it. Just throw in a hashtag and find it. Because like I said, this is not something I had when I was diagnosed. Mm. All I got to do is just throw in a hashtag and just throw up a word in there and do a search. And all kind of stuff is going to pop you can up. find it. More than two handfuls of people. Yeah. Keep mm -hmm. in mind, Here's the flip side of that, though. Not everybody is going to have um, your same mindset because mm -hmm. you're dealing with just everyday, ordinary people. Um, one of the biggest things that uh, will blow your mind is you'll have you'll meet somebody you have like the greatest connection with as far as diabetes is concerned, but you might be a liberal and they might be a Trump supporter, mm -hmm. and then you start seeing something on their feed that's like, "What the whoa, whoa, where to get off?" You're going to run into that. Mm -hmm. and then that's good to know for yourself yeah you know, whether you want to you know deal with somebody like that because they're they're out, they're out there there are people that that are that you will have the closest relationship as far as diabetes is concerned but the moment you post something like black lives matter they're gonna start they're gonna come at you wow okay and that's just the reality of it mm -hmm. that's just flat out reality uh because i've already blocked, uh, unfriended, uh, whatever, <laughs> over that same foolishness. 
and yeah, they were they were people uh, with diabetes like me, but nah, I ain't having it. Right. I, mean, I, can, I can understand if you don't understand, you know what. But not be dismissive. Yeah, but don't be dismissive Just and don't be completely dismissive. dismissive. Yeah, because I'm not having it. Mm -hmm. I don't have to confront you about it. But don't come at me later on. Hey, man, you, did you unfriend me? Yeah, mm -hmm. I did. What yeah. else you need? Well, that's some good advice. So what is that one piece of advice that you would give to someone living and managing diabetes, also a person of color, um, something that you wish someone would have told 25-year-old um, Chelsea when you were newly diagnosed? What is that one piece of, of golden advice you would give? It's going to be difficult, but it's doable. Uh -huh. And the importance of a community. And community. it doesn't have to be a 5,000 friends on Facebook community. It can just be a friend. Mm. Reach out to somebody online and connect with somebody that, that gets it. It's one thing to have your friends understand what you have to deal with, but it's also good to have people that, you, that know exactly what it's like. Mm -hmm. And that's gonna come in handy uh, down the road and that way and then you're going to be there for them when they start to go through diabetes burnout wow. because that's what you need when you go through that, that type of burnout you need somebody to bounce that off of and get that out that actually understands what you're going through you need that and uh, I wish I had that when I was coming up because I think I would have um, I think I would have adjusted a lot better I think I would have um, taking care of myself a lot better. Um, I don't know whether what I was doing wrong caused this. I don't know, but I can't dwell on that. Mm -hmm. uh, it happened. Um, and so you have to just accept the fact that it's going to be difficult. You're going to have them days and you're going to have some good days. Uh, you just, just like in life in general, you just, you Embrace the good days. I like that. It's difficult, but it's doable. Yep. Wow. Chelsea, thank you so much for just the words of wisdom and advice that you've given to the viewers tonight. Where can they find you online? Where can they follow you? How can they get connected to you if they would like to after this summit? Yeah. Um, the two um, places where I'm, where I'm most active is on Twitter and on Instagram. Instagram. I'm at type one, type the number one comedian on Instagram. And as far as Twitter, it's just my name, at Chelsea Rice. You can find my lunacy and silliness there. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, <laughs> that twisted sense of humor that you've referenced several times tonight. It comes out often, especially, you know, and I'm, I've gotten pretty good at these creating my own memes and stuff. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, once you find me, just kind of scroll through it and have a good time and add me and I'll follow you back. So yeah, definitely. Um, and, but thank you for having me. Well, it's been, um, it's been a, a pleasure and, um, I really appreciate what you're doing and uh, I'm going to support mm -hmm. you as much as I can, uh, to keep this thing growing because I don't want it to just be hot for a minute, and yeah. then, you know, and fade away. I want, I want to, I want this summit to be as popular as the ones that I've been to, mm -hmm. uh, the ones that are funded by pharmaceutical companies. Mm -hmm. I want this to grow um, just as big and become just as important uh, because it's necessary. It, I was just about to say that Definitely. it's certainly necessary. It's certainly time and, and, I, and we appreciate you. Thank you again for um, speaking. We say that this is the first annual because this is something that we know needs to be done and needs to happen. Um, on an annual basis, if not more. Um, so again, it's been wonderful talking to you and thank you so much for everything you've shared and given us so much to think about. I know me personally, you've given me a lot <laughs> to think about. Yeah, I go off and just go on different tangents and stuff, but hopefully I got I threw something out there that'll stick and then inspire, so hopefully. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, everybody go out and check those uh, that lunacy and those crazy memes on his Twitter account. Thanks again, Chelsea. I look forward to talking to you very, very, very soon. Take care. Take care.
Thank you.